Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to uh, spend about half an hour talking about some of the developments that are going on in simulating um, or visually reconstructing events, generally contact or collision events, but also the ability to then actually do what if scenarios, lessons learned, reflective learning, and so on, which are currently being used in the industry. Um, and uh, what I'm going to show you is not um, a video game gimmick that we've developed. It's an engineering project tool that we've been working on for 30 years um, and is used extensively through the shipping industry. I'll touch on the sort of people and owners who are using this uh, tool. Um, but it's important just to set that in context that it's, a, it's an engineering tool that's been used on hundreds of support developments, hundreds of navigation studies. It's on board LNG ships, it's on board a lot of cruise ships uh, being used in anger. And we've applied it to this fascinating area of event reconstruction, incursion and analysis. Um, so I'll just say a few words about where we are, who I am. Um, I'll talk about the system that we're using, Rembrandt. I'll mention this a while, but I'll just get it out of the way. Rembrandt is an acronym which we developed back in the early 90s for the real-time maneuvering, birthing and training. Um, so when I say Rembrandt, hopefully you know what I mean. Um, I'll give you some examples of the sorts of things we're doing, but also um, there are things that are going on um, and some of the users of Rembrandt include the likes of the MARB and the Dutch Safety Board and uh, very soon three other major accident investigation statutory bodies around the world um, who have seen this and can see what it can do for them. Um, and then uh, I'll talk a bit about sort of what's going on in terms of current developments. Um, just very quickly, um, a few words about what we do. Um, we do we're, the business I'm in, I look after all this sort of complex metal ocean work um, from near shore, port hydraulics. So um, we do a lot of, a lot of work uh, using satellite data. Um, we get involved with a lot of FLNG and FSU and floating on a gas, quite complex simulation work. Um, and the system I'm going to show you today, Rembrandt, actually has been applied to a lot of FSMG, FSAU, basically operability, birthing and birthing assessments as well, where close proximity interactions between vessels are crucial. Um, and, you know, we cater for all sorts of things, wave shielding, wind shielding, curve shielding, and so on. Um, Rembrandt, uh, which I'll get into. And we do a lot of extreme motion events as well. We understand, um, what we like to think is we understand the net ocean, but we also understand, crucially, how things float on it. And that's where we come from. Uh, okay. This might not work because it goes in field three. Oh, okay. No, it doesn't work. So I'll just keep it the way it is. Yeah. Um, Rembrandt. Bit of a, I'll project my voice. I don't want to crunch over the uh, um, It comes in a variety of forms. Uh, we have it on laptops, we have it on um, desktops, and we have it full scale mission. I mean, examples include um, we have people like Statsco and our head office in London have a dedicated run around training room for the whole fleet. Um, the pilots, we have the pilots, we train pilots around the world, they have it in their, in their offices around the world. They may go to their office, and we can go to pilots' offices and run complex simulations because it's transformed as well. Um, I'm going to, to use it very shortly. High fidelity graphics. This is actually quite a, it doesn't really mean much to anybody in this, but it's actually probably the most toughest hydrodynamic evaluation and certification for a, a simulator. It's not a video game. Uh, it looks okay, but it's a serious bit of computing. Since we've been hundreds of ships are fully validated. I mentioned about complex birthing, <coughs> complex waves. We have multiple swell trains and wind driven waves, so we can simulate all of that. And crucially for getting into accident investigation now, we've got automatic interfaces, which I'll talk about later. It's VDR, VAS, and VTS. And we can take data, literally create a 3D event within. 30 minutes. 
Um, brief history of it, uh, BMT itself goes back to 1887 when the um, Reform and the British Research Association, from the National Maritime Institute. And one of the forefathers of, of that entity was Charles Parsons, of the student program. Okay? And then over the last 70 years, we've been doing a lot of tank testing work, sea keeping, maneuverability. And that fed into, back in 1989, when P&O Ferries and Stella came to me and said, can we do a simulator for our vessels, just getting in and out of Dover and Calais, under very heavy conditions. Um, and so we developed something on like a transmitter, which was quite revolutionary then, to think about it, sort of 30 odd years ago, Fruity. Um, and then since then, we've gone all the MC based, so it's electronic charts. Um, it's been on, it's been sold on about 90 cruise ships, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, Disney. So it's been used for 25 years on the bridges there, probably for SCC W95. And it's been used in anger for a long time. Well, recently we put them on LNG vessels, um, train, obviously, new cadets and so on as well, and to look at what if scenarios um, in real time. And we've, been, we've probably worked on over 500 port assessments over the years as well. Yes, um, yeah, enabling, um, and then recently we've been getting into that investigation. So, just to show you what this thing is, um, basically, when we do a new model, we take various details in terms of the DA, um, sea star data if they're available, zigzag, start stop, crash stop, turning circle, engine details, rudder, propeller, thruster. And we just build a model and create it. But actually, because we've got hundreds of validated models now, we end up just tweaking models to get an exact representation. Now, that is only relevant when you want to do a what if of a collision. Because uh, if you just want to create, recreate a vent visually, you don't have to do anything like this because you just actually use standard models that look very similar to the vessel in question. But if you actually then take it a step further to say, right, that's great, but I want to do some what ifs now. I want to take control, see what would have happened if I'd done this, slow down. Um, then we use models that are already there in the system. Um, lots of vessels. I mean, we've got all sorts of um, LNG vessels. Um, took an offshore container, boat carriers, and so on, all in the systems. So, here we go. Um, that's the TV screen. I believe you see it, but um, there's the engine controls here, tugs, definitely keel, and there's your vessel, and in 3D as well. And the sort of things you do, we've been doing this for years and years. You can basically look at um, this takes a bit of time, so I'll just fast it. I'll fast forward. But basically, you can birth, unbirth, look at palliative requirements as well, and so on. All weather effects are in there. So if you've got gusting, you've got bank effects, shallow water effects, squat, well, it's all catered for. Um, uh, in terms of vessels actually going down a channel, I'll not dwell on this very much, but you can see the high, hopefully you can appreciate the high fidelity nature of this. Uh, you have the actual weather conditions put in there mathematically, and you can maneuver a vessel down a channel. I'll just fast forward this so you get an appreciation in terms of the sea keeping analysis as well and um, heavy weather response. So, before I show you some examples of collisions, um, some of the people who are using that rap, uh, in terms of the oil and gas uh, majors, in terms of tankers and floating on the gas, we've got Exxon Mobil, we have these types of gas log, we like gas log have about um, quite a large number of licenses actually on their gas ships. Um, uh, ENI, Gola, China now. Um, a lot of complex strokes with the offshore rigs. Uh, Phoebe Corpus Christi, where you've got very narrow channels, where you've got literally a meter depth with keel, of these big rigs being towed out, and literally half a meter of clearance between the bank. Very complex. Um, we do mostly pretty much all of the work in that area as well because Rembrandt's actually very accurate um, and it's been proven time and time again. Talked about crews. These are the port companies, developers who've used this over the years. Some of the big boys over there looking for channel design, pro channel design, where to put a jetty, um, palliative requirements, 
Um, we want bigger ships coming into our port. What do we do? So we've done a lot of that work. Um, these are the, in terms of accident investigations, we, uh, we do um, a drone line of work looking at accidents. Uh, recently, we had a day that the safety board and the Royal New York and others that I can't actually mention right now, similar statutory bodies who would adopt run um, one. As either through the Fendi Review, we've heard of MADAS, which is something that the MERB have used, it's a two dimensional sort of visualization software of vision. Um, and they are being used right about now as the 3D version and will eventually move on to run by only Dutch safety board uh, uh, and will be run mad ass out and we just take a run around to use for all our investigations. So for us this was an important sort of cornerstone of credibility where we've got the statutory bodies actually adopting run run. Um, in terms of um, how we get all the data to look at a, an accident or an event. Um, and it's important to say actually a lot of our, a lot of our clients actually, it doesn't have to be a collision, but it could be a near miss. And they actually have procedures in place in house to say, right, let's do a lessons learned. Um, reflective learning um, imperative so that an accident didn't happen, but it was close to happening. We need to know why. So we're seeing a lot of that now, a lot of applications of this. Uh, but basically, just to read your files, uh, we can read in any, any virtual, any format of VDR because the MERB asked us to write um, software which takes in any VDR formats because they have to do that as well. And it converts it into a CSV file, a common separate variable, which Rembrandt can process um, speed, force, um, helm, and engine settings, and so on, all track in here. Um, it also reads in the AIS formats as well. <coughs> what we have to be careful of is, is that we get the right quality AIS data. Um, generally, um, you know, one second granularity uh, is good, but they may, that might not be available. But frankly, most days there are a lot of suppliers internationally who will sell you pretty good granular AIS data for two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. So that's not really a big issue. Um, and then what about this rest? It takes in all of these files and generally will create a, a 3D uh, within about 30 minutes. So the times where um, you know, it can take weeks and weeks to get everything together, synchronized, um, it's, it's, it's all done you know, almost at an instant. And it's unadulterated data as well because that's quite important. We just basically take the data and we just dump it into a, uh, a video file. One example. Um, we did, uh, this is a case study, um, Singapore, um, Bessemer, Panamax, Bull Carrier, Transing the Northeast Bound Lane, second on a crude oil tanker crossing the southwest lane to join the Northeast Bound Lane, both were full ahead. And hopefully, this will work in this area of high technology when we have to rely on cables and laptops falling over. Um, let's hope this works. But um, we dumped the VDR data straight into Rembrandt. And this is what it gives you. There's two vessels you'll see. One you're watching from the bridge of the Rembrandt vessel that we can actually control because we also have a model in there of how it behaves and maneuvers. The second vessel is generated through EAS data that we've got from the second vessel. So that's what this plays. It's quite a long file, but I'll propose to let it go, get some context, and then I can actually fast forward it to the bits where it gets interesting. That's the EIS vessel. This is the uh, EIS vessel. This is the screen. We've created this in about 20 minutes. You can see this vessel jumping on the screen. That's purely because we chose to use AS data, which was not very popular. So typically five second gaps in AS. We could have easily procured one second AS data from that. But perhaps not as smooth. But we can see this as well by interpreting the AS. Yeah, 
the conditions at the time are mimicked as well. So you're seeing exactly what what happens there. Okay. So that's the that's the now, I'll just forward it a bit till it gets more interesting. So, um, it got quite messy. Um, the interesting thing was that if both had independently maintained speed and force, they would have missed each other. So they talked themselves into a collision. Um, and a number of lessons learned came out of that, which were quite clear. Um, and in terms of sort of training, um, it proved to be extremely useful. Um, that would have taken us about an hour to compile. So we just get AS, and now, that was two years ago, we just buy one second granular AS data, so you wouldn't get that second ship jumping up, it would just be slow. Um, and as I mentioned, at any time, you could, if it's rather than just recreating, which you saw just an event recreation from using unadulterated video, video on AS data. Um, if it's part of a lessons learned, then obviously you might want to change one or two things in that. So at any time, that vessel from the bridge you're looking at, you could just press stop and take control on the simulator to see what would have happened if. Um, this is a second a recent uh, work we did, which actually came from the Dutch safety board in The Hague. They'd heard about Rembrandt through the MEIB and said, okay, can we give you some tests? 
And I don't know how well you can see this. It's not that good in the lighting here. But we've got two vessels. The Auto Rambler, which is the small vessel there, and the Atlantic Jupiter. This was just off Sub I think, um, 2016. Um, this right hand side is the plot that the, DA, the Dutch Safety Board created themselves using VTR. And you'll see as I move this forward, we've got two vessels and anchor that are dragging. And the Atlantic Jupiter, Jupiter Ups, up anchors and tries to get away safely, but you didn't have enough power. So what you'll see is two vessels slowly going towards each other, and there was a collision. Um, and what we said, and it took them about two months to compile all this. And what we said is, right, you go and get hold of some AS data, you give it the VDR data, and we'll come up with this in a day. So we actually got it, and the right hand screen here is what Rembrandt did. And you'll see on the VDR here, the heading of this is bouncing all over the place because of the plot in their data. And I'll just scroll and you'll see basically on Rembrandt what happens. So, uh, right, just to fast forward, look at the right hand screen, you'll see the two vessels, BTS, and then they just come into each other. But the heading of the large orange one is actually moving all over the place. Right. But if you look at the left-hand one now, with Rembrandt using one-second AIS data, this is a 2D, I'll show you 3D in a moment. It just, it's nice and steady. There we go. There. So what we did was we put it all in, and we created two views from each bridge. So this is the first vessel. Um, and you can synchronize the timing so you can see simultaneously the view from both vessels. You can actually have any viewpoint you want. Um, the C state was just we, we um, put in, um, and it allowed the Dust Safety Board to basically see what happened. So, um, if I, what I will do is I will come out of full screen. Screen. And hopefully this will allow you, if you can see it, simultaneously from both vessels to the same other vessel. Um, it's high fidelity, but I'm not sure if it's doing it justice from the overhead projector there. Um, and then you can fast forward it and you can see it. And the good thing is, because it's synchronized, you can actually compare with the statements at any time to see, well, actually, this is what this chap did see. So, um, and the fact that we pulled this together in less than 24 hours when it took them about, well, a certain number of weeks actually convinced them to go with this. And they've been using this, and I'm using it in a lot of work now as well. And uh, particularly with the MARB being kind of one of the gold standards for accident investigation worldwide, we have a lot of other statutory bodies now sort of um, actively looking to get this in for our accident investigation work. Um, and again, um, the, uh, you know, it's, it should be wished to then go forward, for example, to develop what would happen there. We can simply just take a model from our database, and give it us two kits of matches, and then we can actually start to play some, well, what would have happened if we'd done this instead. So um, what I will do is just come out. And fast forward, so you'll see there, just fast forward the vessel, similarly. So take that forward. So I believe that gives you an idea of the sort of things you can do. This was another one which I won't really dwell on, but it was basically an interesting one. At the um, we were asked to look at the city, the city of Rotterdam, Primula Series collision in the Humber. I think it was a couple of years ago, and that was an interesting one because it, the notion was there that the pilot was. Um, 
confused by what we call relative motion illusion. I don't know if anyone's come across this. It's because of the design of the bow, he was off center and he actually totally missed where the center line of the ship was. So when he was looking at the vessel, he was actually giving the inappropriate commands. But had he had a bow to have a reference point, then that relative motion illusion wouldn't have crept in. So we, um, let's take it forward. And we, could, we were able to, um, we, were, we were able to reconstruct this relative motion effect, motion illusion effect on this theory as well, because we can look at the issue of the bow as well. So that's something we've been doing as well. But where there are a lot of collision work, lots of collision work that's ongoing that we can't talk about. And there's a lot of work that particularly the MEIV are actually doing now with various collisions that again we can't really talk about, but it's been used in anger more and more. Um, just to finish off, I mentioned the issues about AAS data this morning. So there's no excuse these days. You can really get a hold of very high quality AAS data, not very expensively, um, so that you can now see the without any jumps. Um, we've just put in the ability now to take up the control of the course slow down if you want to look at what would happen there. I'm actually interested at the moment where I've been asked to interface Rembrandt with a lot of autonomous and semi autonomous vessels to use Rembrandt with operational awareness simulators to look at what autonomous vessels and how you handle shared water space conflicts between a fully manned vessel, say a ferry, and a uh, partially manned vessel or an autonomous, autonomous vessel. And there's lots of them sitting around the sun at the moment, test pilot uh, test vessels. But what happens because Captain of Ferry, um, the autonomous vessel might know what it wants to do, but the Captain of the Ferry might, have, he might not have a clue what the uh, autonomous surface vessel is going to do. And there's an issue there about risks in shared water space, and that's going to grow. So we're doing a lot of work in that area as well. But um, that just gives you a flavor of the sorts of work we're doing in accident investigation, contact and collision work. And the key thing it gives you is the ability just to take data and dump it and get it out quick, to quickly visualize an event, even before you want to start looking at, well, why did it happen and what should have been done in the first place? But, um, uh, you know, I don't know if anyone's got any questions or any comments, happy to take them. Um, a question between a completely non-mast manned background. The initial collision shows the three of these can and smaller vessels. At the climax, being an autonomous vessel, how might that interaction play out? Oh goodness! I think um, the, 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 the challenge there is for the manned vessel to know what the autonomous vessel is going to do. Is it going to be that you know? What's it, what, what, what's it going to do? Um, we're looking at the moment at simulating hundreds and hundreds of possible scenarios for two vessels, one's autonomous, one's not, about um, generating statistical data to see the likelihood of either the manned vessel making the wrong decision because it's not knowing what the other vessel's going to do, or the AUV itself with its current machine learning and AI, actually what it can do as well. And also what it's capable of doing in, within the sea states. Um, I mean, that's a really hot topic. Moment. The IMO formed a working group, I think, to look at the impact on shared water space for unmanned vessels and manned vessels, because it's an area that needs to be looked at um, to see whether the current, you know, car regs or rules of the road are actually applicable. Um, and to what extent new risks are come into it when you've got an unmanned vessel and a, a manned vessel as well. We're actually just starting a two-year project, actually, with an autonomous vessel designer who has boats in the water in the um, English Channel, pilot vessels, um, uh, just pilot test vessels. And we're gonna run a lot of um, simulations to get some good statistics about basically where the risks lie going forward. So ask me again in a couple of years and I can probably tell you. Any other questions for Bill?